Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the My Tech Story Africa podcast. My name is Alice Kanjejo, your lovely host. And before we get into the episode, I definitely want to acknowledge that this has been the month we've experienced the most growth at My Tech Story Africa on our social media platforms as well as our YouTube. Thank you so, so much for everybody who's subscribed, who's been engaging with us. Our website clicks as well has been the highest it's ever been this month. And I am eternally grateful. Let's keep pushing. If you've not yet subscribed, subscribe from wherever you're listening from whether that's on youtube or the major listening platforms on spotify apple Podcasts, or any of your favorite listening platforms check out our website at mtsafrica.co we have some cool stuff that we are lining up on there we are also rolling out a new exciting series as well as the newsletters that are coming soon so stay tuned we have a lot more to catch up on and if you want to stay on top of your game as what as to what's happening in the african tech landscape then this is definitely the place to be that being said, we will get into today's guest, who I am very excited to introduce. Today's guest is Robert Sabuni, and his story unfolds the fascinating chapters of his extraordinary journey from lecturing at a number of universities like African Leadership University to being the head of training and knowledge manager at Power Land Project. At Power Land Project, the heart of their mission lies in the dedication to train a staggering one million software developers across the diverse landscape of Africa. Through their well crafted 16 week hybrid program, the main goal is to narrow the skill gap between fresh graduates and the dynamic demands of the tech industry. How do we then bridge that gap? Of we have people who are graduates in tech, uh, but then the skills that are required by tech companies, they don't kind of have them. How do we come in between and solve uh, that problem? So our goal was to design a program that is aimed at first imparting skills to millions, yes, but making sure that the people who are getting these skills um, can actually put them to work. In this episode, Robert paints a vivid picture of the impactful success stories that have come out from this approach with thousands of graduates not only acquiring critical skills, but also venturing into the realm of entrepreneurship, birthing startups that contribute to the tech ecosystem. The episode concludes with a very powerful message. No one has monopoly over knowledge. Always be ready to listen and learn. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed having him as a guest on this podcast. Learn a thing or two. And yeah, with that being said, let's get into the episode. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. We do have a special guest that I've been eager to interview. I think we've been going back and forth to see when we can finally set a time that works for everyone. I'm very excited to introduce to you Robert from Powerland Project. I'll give him the opportunity to introduce himself, and then we'll get to hear more about his story. So, Robert, feel free to introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Robert Wakesa I'm from Powerland, as mentioned. Uh, basically at Powerland, I'm the knowledge manager that's in charge of the training department, but professionally um, in training. Professionally you're in training. Yes. Okay, I think we'll get to know more about that as we go along. I think as we get to know more about you and the occupation that you've just mentioned at Powerland Project, I want to take you back to maybe your older days when you were younger. So was this something you saw yourself in the future? Were you ever interested in tech uh, growing up? Or what were your interests when you were younger? What did you want to become? Where did your story begin? Actually, when I was growing up, I didn't think much of tech. Probably back then, there wasn't much of tech mm -hmm. around to, to inspire you to get in. Um, back, in uh, back in primary school, I was quite good in sciences. I did love sciences went to high school, still continued loving sciences. My best, like for example, subjects were sciences. And by all the of time, them, <coughs> biology, yeah, physics, Yeah, I did all chemistry. of them. And That's lovely. Yeah, did well <laughs> in all of them. So that was awesome. Yeah, um, by the completion of high school, I wanted to do pharmacy. I actually chose pharmacy as my wow. course for university and did qualify for it, only that, when there was the changing of courses uh, period, made my cousin who convinced me that no, tech was much better than mm -hmm. going into pharmacy. 
Sorry, what do you mean by change of courses? And did you decide to do pharmacy because you were good in the sciences or was it something you knew, this is what I want to do? No, I did love chemistry. And by connection, probably chemistry led to mm -hmm. something within the field of pharmacy or medicine. Mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine who was quite good. He went to do medicine. So I decided also to, to do pharmacy. But, you know before placement uh, by the university, the, the, the university's board, it's called Board of Placements. Mm -hmm. uh, learn, students are given a chance to change their courses if they want to rethink their choices. Mm -hmm. So during that period is when I say, no, let me do computer science. What let was me... that? I want to really get into what was that shift? Because that's such a big shift of pharmacy to doing computer science, you know, for someone who had the background in sciences, you know, I think there must have been that changing point for saying, okay, we're going to do tech. Was it the trajectory that we were seeing tech come into or what was it that made you fully make that decision to change courses? I think as I mentioned earlier, I was good in sciences. So mm -hmm. uh, computer science basically science so <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. also good quite good in physics and physical science and computer science mm -hmm. they call quite close so basically what made me change was my cousin had done actually computer science mm -hmm. and he had computers in his house and he could I could see from my point of view the power he wielded mm. over the rest of us given that he could do quite a number of things that mm -hmm. the rest of us couldn't do. Yeah. And that quite <clears throat> got me thinking, at uh, this is an exciting field from the perspective of uh, much of the power is now in your hands yes. to create. Exactly. Um, pharmacy is a good discipline, so is medicine and all those other uh, fields. But I could say because of the um, they have been there for centuries yes. and much of their structures are now established and you can't really move within as easily. Yeah. Um, I can, I want to call it rigid, but it may not be the right word, but Maybe within computing, mm -hmm. actually it's changing daily, daily and you have the power to create. So you can actually choose to be a leader within uh, the field. So yes. the thought of if I start in tech, then probably my um, my doors will be opened and there will be so many ways in which to do what I want to do. Yes. That kind of got me thinking maybe this is the maybe exciting this is something place. something you should do. And I completely in. agree with that. I think working in the tech space, there's such opportunity for the constantly evolving. This, this year, we've talked a lot about AI. Two years ago, it was something that we were not really having many conversations on. And it was not too long ago, 10 years, 15 years, that computers were even introduced into the market. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth compared to already established industries that have been there for ages, like you've mentioned, like pharmacy, which is very hard to make a an impact if, like as an individual as yes. it would be if you decide to do the same in tech so that does make a lot of sense um i don't i don't know if you mind me asking was there at this time did you grow up in nairobi and around what time period was this or yeah I actually came to nairobi the first time when i was joining campus oh wow okay so where <laughs> did you grow up um was born in uh, kitale grew up in kitale that is in transoya mm -hmm. uh, county mm -hmm. uh, so was born in Kitale, went to high school in uh, Bungoma County, mm -hmm. friend school, Kamsinga. And then after that, that's when I now came to Nairobi to, to join uh, my university. So much mm -hmm. of my childhood and my growing up was actually back at home uh, mm -hmm. in Transaya County, Kitale. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and would you say it was maybe difficult to make that transition or were a lot of people at that time, you know, Sometimes when you grow up in the rural kind of, I don't know that to call it rural, but outside of Nairobi, um, sometimes you'd hear maybe students decide not to continue pursuing higher education or whatnot. Would you say that it was maybe difficult for you to grow up in such an environment or was it just very direct, this is what I want to do and I need to make that impact and come out of here? Um, I think the experience was... Um what made me choose that or to stick in school and make something out of my life 
was kind of, um, it was um, a factor of many things, mm -hmm. uh, if I could say. Um, I was a, a child of a single parent, so unfortunately, that was my mother, and she, <coughs> she quite was ill. And so the only, for example, f savior as for me was education. Mm. So um, as much as it was something not good, it was a very strong motivator yeah, a strong to, motivator. To, to stick to school. Yeah. And so when I joined high school, um, that was the thing that I had. If I don't go through with school, then there's probably not, nothing much left uh, yeah. to do. Um, of course, in rural areas, you, you, you'll marry and have yeah. so many kids yes. and um, life That's continues. Life. So when to friend school comes, I said, uh, my mom passed on around when I was in Form 1. And um, I had a very good um, principal, Mr. Simon Abukwesi. You probably have heard of him. Now Maybe. he goes by the title Ambassador Nabukwesi. Um, he... She's moved straight from high school to an ambassadorial duty. And in my thinking, he really deserved it. So mm -hmm. uh, this is the gentleman who understood my case and basically kept me in school mm -hmm. uh, despite not affording uh, to pay wow. the fee uh, for the school, other than just keeping him in school, also uh, supporting all through. So basically, I had education as the thing that... Um, the only thing that I had, then I had quite a number of people who also were invested in my journey. So letting them down couldn't mm -hmm. have been possible. So mm -hmm. that's basically was the main driving force uh, through high school, then of course, yeah. to campus. Yeah, no, I love that you, you know, <coughs> received the support that you needed at that time for yeah. you to really pursue education. And I think what also helped is that you were a really smart kid from what you mentioned, you were really good at the sciences and what, and you would qualify even for, uh, you know, courses like pharmacy. And so you stick into education, especially in an environment that may be everybody is kind of looking like they might just go that traditional path of, okay, marriage, kids, and then life continues. So I applaud you for really sticking it through and, you know, getting to where you are today. Yeah. Okay. That was an interesting <laughs> diversion. I think now you're in university, you've settled on computer science. How was that experience in university? Where did you study? Uh, I went to JQAT, uh, mm -hmm. Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. Um, the experience was interesting. As I said, um, grew up in back uh, in rural areas, so getting to university and you're doing computer science, mm -hmm. not much experience with computers. Um, funny story, first day of class, mm -hmm. uh, you get to computer lab and we had this desktop screen on top, uh, the central process, the CPU mm -hmm. uh, under the table. So I asked, switch on your computer and you switch on the screen and, <laughs> yeah. and wait for it to start and nothing is happening. <laughs> So yeah. I had a friend who told me, no, the main computer to, is down is there. Down so there. The, the start wasn't easy, yes. uh, but then I quickly got into the floor. Um, it was good. Uh, we had uh, colleagues who had the opportunity to have earlier introduction to computers compared mm. to some of us who came uh, from the rural areas. Mm -hmm. They did packages and all that. Yes. So. There was a gap at the beginning, but I think within a month or so, we were all at we par. All at and par. it was a great experience. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's good. And would you, I mean, was it really difficult for you for that month? Did you feel like giving up or did you know, I really want to follow this through? No, I think it was uh, a mixture of excitement okay. and, yeah. um, and expectation, uh, basically, we were out to discover. Mm. Uh, you are in a big university, there are books in the library, mm -hmm. there is a computer lab, you have peers who know something that you don't know. Mm -hmm. So you basically have all the avenues that you can make yourself better. Yeah. So it was um, more of looking forward to see what we can do what more can do. than getting frustrated that I'm in a strange environment, yeah. I may not make it. Yeah, I like, okay. 
recently I've been talking I've been thinking a lot more about people who may have their mentality stuck into the victim the victim kind of mentality I'm not able to do this because I didn't have a background in this or I'm in this position so I can't change circumstances and I think that's opposite of what you're describing is like you were always just eager to learn more okay I may not know this but I want to know what's next and so that's a really good trait to have and I think it's really pushed you through to get to where you are today and I hope you also don't mind me asking but okay now there's a transition from uh, the rural area to coming to Nairobi what was life like when you just came into Nairobi <laughs> you know are you living in this hostels or what was going on with you and how was it just transitioning to a big city was it overwhelming <laughs> <coughs> yeah kind of I, i will say so i remember the first day when i landed in nairobi you know we used to use the eldorado express and the landmark was afia afia, <laughs> afia center afia center the greenhouse yes yes so go there looked for matatus to to thika um go to thika um, went to university i was to receive help but it had delayed mm -hmm. so I went to university to make my case to the university mm -hmm. that supposed to join but um my money is not yet here mm -hmm. uh, so i got here on my own went to jk on my own wow. i think one thing i believed is if people have done it so <laughs> it shouldn't be an exception yes. for you yes. yeah Okay. If it's been done then then then, then you, can you can do, do it. it. Yeah. Okay. So that was the start. Um I went to to, to university the university said no you need to oh have no. the money first. Oh no. So I went back to Nakuru. Um got a job actually at a petrol station called Hyrax. Uh, Shell. Wow. Shell Hyrax. Uh Previously I didn't mention I was actually working there. Uh, oh. waiting for my chance to go to university. Mm -hmm. You see, that was the one and a half year wait period after yes. high school yes. and campus. So when I convinced my colleagues, we were working with the two to put together some money. Wow. Uh, so got 20,000. Uh, that was what was required, given that I was a, a sponsored government yes. student. I didn't require much. So I uh, got the 20K, went paid. Um, started my schooling then uh, my help came through uh sent back to my guys in akuru and oh uh, so you asked them for a loan it wasn't yeah. they were giving you no 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 it was a loan no, but did we, you anticipate okay help is going to come and then you're going to pay them back for yeah this? The, the help was kind of like um assured mm. uh, given that you are a, a government sponsored student mm -hmm. and you've applied for help and they have already um given you notification that it's been accepted mm -hmm. it's just the disbursement yes. of the funds that yes. was not uh, yet done so i was sure it will come through uh, so there were my guys i couldn't yeah. have gotten the money from them if i wasn't sure yeah i was going to get it back yeah so mm -hmm. once all that was done went back to campus got a hostel within campus um the biggest one in jq it was hey. called hall six um <laughs> so Yeah, and that, that's, that's how, how we you started settled. off. That's how you settled. I think it's very inspirational that you had real life extreme moments where you could have given up, but you really chose to, this is my goal, this is what I want to do, especially for education. This is the path that I really want to uh, go by. So I think a lot of people in the positions that, in the situations that maybe you had to endure or experience, um, would maybe not have thought through how to maneuver that. So I'm really, I think that's an inspiring part of your story and you've not even got to where you are today, but I do think that's really inspiring and you should be very proud for that um, <laughs> experience that you've had so far till getting to university. So yeah, okay. So now university, you're learning more about computer science. Along the lines, maybe you're entering third year, moving to the last year. What are you thinking career-wise? Are you thinking, okay, maybe I'm going to get become a developer or what did you start? Did you think maybe I need to start looking for jobs? What was going on with you? Uh, towards the completion, uh, we, of course, thinking now this is coming to an end. Uh, what is going to come next? And, of course, you know you get out of university and you need to find a job. Um, and you know that the, the industry that we are in 
more focuses on the skills that you have more than the certification yes. that you bring exactly. along uh, with yourself. So basically we start um, trying to find ways of how can we be marketable out there. Yeah. Yeah, because once you're coming out, then you realize reality is hitting you. We yeah. actually started sending job applications when we were in fourth year. Uh, not much came out of it. Mm -hmm. um, finished, graduated, and uh, then once we were out, of course, what we knew in our minds is print your CV. Didn't also there wasn't much on the CV, uh, but just saying. <coughs> some of the experience that you had during your attachment, then basically your qualification and your references. Mm -hmm. So you could send them in so many places, but um, the responses were very limited. Very limited. Yes. And the interviews you could get mostly were for internships. Uh, some of them were for free internships. And you are in Nairobi, you need mm. at least money, some to, money to, to get going. So. We said to find a way of now upgrading the skills besides mm -hmm. um, the I passed the degree, uh, got out. What can you do? That mm -hmm. was usually the question. So <clears throat> personally, I enrolled with, um, there was this software development company. Mm -hmm. It called itself GJ People. Uh, mm -hmm. It specialized in Java programming. Mm -hmm. And they had a very good model of uh, learning. Basically, it was more like, you're creating a project, you are a learner, mm, but you start off doing, like you're creating okay. a project. And went through it, and I think it was uh, of great help for me mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. uh, it took like six months. It was also virtual. Mm -hmm. um, it took six months. And after that, I got my first uh, job opportunity. Um, interestingly, it was in training, not that oh, I was wow. looking to go into training just that my first engagement was uh, training. Mm -hmm. There was a small college in, I <coughs> in Nairobi CBD that was doing computer science training. So I came on board and because I had that experience um, that I had learned the software development, I got in uh, yeah. my first job. Yes. Uh, so worked at it for um, almost a year, I think. Mm -hmm and then got a different opportunity, still in training, uh, to a college within still Westlands called uh, Graffins College. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if I it do still know. operates. I did know about that one. Yeah. Was there for one or two years, I think. Mm -hmm. And then got another opportunity again to uh, Osho College mm. within Parklands. Mm. Yes. So... so before you get any further, I think I just want to get into the details of what you've just mentioned. So um, you mentioned that, okay, you've graduated and then you went through the program. Um, what was it like getting those rejections and you know that this is life or death situation and you need a job? So I want to know like what that experience was. Was it tough? Do you feel like you had friends who give up, who <coughs> gave up in the process? You know, there's always, I think, fourth year of uni slash the first year of uni really builds a foundation and really sets apart like how people were actually working while they were in uni. So here you are, you finished college and then now you're having this training opportunity. Let me also just ask what you did for your internship and how you actually did manage to get into the program. Was it a paid program or was it something that you had to also figure out how to navigate? So basically I think when you get to university, it's all the excitement. Around when you're about to finish that year, fourth year, you can't wait to go out. Yeah. The minute you get out, then um, before you get out, you have this picture in your yeah. mind of this awesome office. Once you get the job, the newspaper, breakfast served, big mm. table, <laughs> um, your own yes. telephone line. Uh, for people to take your requests from. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you get out, you go for the first interview. And the minute you are asked questions, uh, you actually realize you'll not get the job and it's not the interviewer's fault that it's, you not yeah. get the job. You it's just like realize you don't moment. know you quite don't know. much. Yes. And computer science is so heavy on mathematics. And so at one point, actually, I was like, 
did I sign up for computer science or for mathematics? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of logic that <coughs> needed to be get into. Yeah, it. quite a lot. So the, the understanding we lacked was the foundation of computing was actually within mathematics. But I will say there wasn't much connection um, from the math we learned and the computing that we were yeah. supposed to connect. I was also just so, going to ask, while in uni, were you having that daily interactions with computers to do what you needed to do? Because we did have a guest on the podcast who mentioned, okay, we went to do computer science in university, but I was only we only had one computer <laughs> that were sharing all of us on campus. No, for us, I think we were, I will say privileged. Yes. Our computer labs were equipped. Okay. Mm -hmm. The computers were not good mm -hmm. but at least they could do, do something um uh, something mm -hmm. so the, the computers were good um the, the challenge was the the match that you did mostly was focused on passing the exam mm, it's true yes yeah, so if you're doing java programming for example uh, the question you are looking at is what will get me to pass so mm -hmm. You'll probably look at one program, uh, the lecture I gave you, and try to remember every bit of it, knowing it could come in the exams. Mm -hmm. And if it did, then you are so good in that, and you get your air, and okay. you move on to yeah, that's the next step. Yeah. Yeah. And the math that we did and the computing that we did, there was no connection for okay. us to make, mm -hmm. to understand why we are doing math in the mm -hmm. first place. <coughs> So once you get out, you realize the match that you did as far as software development was so minimal that no software development company is willing to, to hire you. Uh, they will, the best they can give you is an internship. Yes. Uh, and mostly unpaid one. So mm. we didn't have much to start with. Mm -hmm. So you are a graduate, then you get out and you realize it's like you never actually went to school. You never went to school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was, I think, a big challenge. and. Most guys just hang up the boots with this, I went to university whole thing and try something else. Mm. Yeah, so you, I did ask about my internship. Mm -hmm. We went one, when we went third year, I got an internship through application uh, to Mombasa. Mm -hmm. um, I was working in this freight company, clearing and forwarding. I think it's clearing and forwarding, not freight. I'm not sure if they are related, <laughs> yeah. So um, I was a computer support guy, mm. kind of just assisting users. My computer doesn't work, go oh, fix. Okay. Um, I need to have this, go help out and all that. So at that point is when actually I learned about the JJ people I just spoke about. So upon completion is when now I pursued them to get uh, uh, that experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <clears throat> I okay. did my internship in Mombasa. Uh, then came back now to university to finish off the fourth year. Okay, now that makes sense. And then now you got this job opportunity as in training. Yes. While you started working in training, did you start thinking, okay, is this I have keen interest on this, or is it Ian Like that was no, at just... that point, my interest was to get in software development. Mm. But then I needed to uh, put food on my table. Yes, and training was the closest thing to it because I was still training software development. The intention was to continue in training, at least provide for myself as I work on my software development mm. skills. Mm. Uh, so I kept um, looking for ways in which I could improve uh, my development skills. So you still weren't thinking training is what I want to do. This is just a side gig that I'm doing. Yeah, initially um, in the first two institutions, um, that was when I was at the first one called regional, the second was called graphins. Um, the conditions within the training environment wasn't as enticing as I was, mm. I had actually, um, envisioned. Uh, envisioned. Yes. So, but when I got to the third one, I think Osho college, um, it kind of changed a little bit. Uh, the way of training was different. Uh, they were actually doing a British system where they really centered on, the, they did focus on, um, on projects. And so at that moment, there was now this actual involvement with actual creation mm -hmm. compared to the previous uh, experience where it was just instruction, instructions, mm -hmm. and not much. Mm -hmm. um, 
So at this moment, I kind of got into it. Mm. And at that point, I actually went back to, to school. I went to oh, register wow. for my master's at okay. University of Nairobi, um, got accepted, and then started. So I, st- I went... The, sorry, what was the master's in? Computer science still or...? Yes, computer science, but um, a different kind of speciality, mm-hmm. uh, um, distributed computing mm-hmm. and cyber security. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, it was called distributed computing and cyber security. Uh, so I went back to s- once I realized training probably is good, just the context of how you're going about it was what really did matter. Mm-hmm. And for you to thrive within the academic sphere, uh, then your academic qualifications can't also stay at the same level. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> and then went back to Nairobi University, uh, registered for my master's, um, got help again mm. um, to pay for it. So, this was how long after you finished your degree? I did graduate in 2010. I started my master's in 20. 2013. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 2013. So, on estimate, I was at regional for one year, graphics one year, and then. Then uh, you went to do Oshel. your masters, Oshel, yes. then masters. Then Oshel, then my masters. Were so, you working while doing your masters at Oshel? Yes, still? yes, yes. Okay. Uh, it mm-hmm. was uh, the masters was um, evening classes. Okay. So, mm-hmm. from work to class, mm. home, work to class, home. Mm-hmm. Then at that time, I also got thinking. Um, what if I also studied something on the side? So given that I grew up in Kitale, an agricultural town, I thought I probably could do agriculture, but I can take it a notch higher. Mm-hmm. So let me do agribusiness. Mm-hmm. So I did, um, while still at Oshola and still at Univ- <laughs> University of Nairobi, you added- I bought some greenhouses, uh, took them to Kitale, um, set them up, uh, started running them. So the challenge was one person trying to do all the three things. And physically being in three places almost at once. Exactly. Yes. So what I used to do is I could go to, to from Monday to Friday work at Nairobi University, Friday evening get into bus, direct express, I land in uh, Kitale in the morning, wow. night travel, uh, get to the farm on Saturday, work within the greenhouses on Sunday, uh, within the greenhouses on Sunday in the evening, get in the bus, then Monday morning, a light yes. at Westlands, then just cross over to, hey. to Osho U, uh, College. I, I did, I did want it to work. I really did want it to work. So I put in all the, all the, the, energy, the energy, the effort that, that, could. that I, that I could Are you even having in. a social life with that kind of program? <laughs> The social life was probably to come once all that had worked out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because that's very intensive. I mean, it's almost every single day you're doing something. Did it get overwhelming? It did at one point. And I had to, 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 to come to the tough decision of which one should I let go, uh, go for now. So um, given that um, I was usually in Kitale some weekends, not all of them, uh, when you're not there, I just realized that the, the attention you put in, given that you've put in the money, wasn't the same attention the people you have entrusted to help mm. you could also mm-hmm. put in. Yeah. So um, I could harvest the tomatoes. I was doing tomatoes, take them to Kitale Town supermarket called Hetia. Um, then they will pay. Uh, so my, um, my aunt could go to collect the cash. Uh, basically, they will, before the cash got to me, There's it was a, it wasn't much left. And given that it's family, you are also limited in the way you can protest. Can, yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, so the wise thing was probably I let it go for now and concentrate on my masters. Your masters. Yeah. So did I did. You uh, let go of the Oshol? No, no, the Oshol school to... was. I uh, could manage that mm. with my masters, mm. and I was when you are doing masters and you've taken help, then um, um, you, can't you have to, to pay 
oh. the loan is you are learning. Oh, really? It's not like undergraduate where you learn, then you will pay, you later. pay later. So I needed to have the work to pay the help to pay mm. for my master's. Was <laughs> that stressful, paying back the loans for education for not only your undergrad? I mean, how long did that was that I think I want to get to know more about Actually, how they were the both. health program They were both running works. concurrently. Uh, for for um, for masters, once the money is disbursed, you're given a letter to take to the employer to start deducting mm, and from, remit the money. And how much percent would they deduct from what you're getting? They were they were a little bit kind of um, understanding for undergraduate. I was I think remitting five um, uh, k for my masters. It was. 8k monthly so mm. in total it came to around 13k uh, monthly so it wasn't wow. uh, very punishing mm -hmm. but also the money that was coming in from employment wasn't that much, much. to say mm. uh, 13k i'm just comfortable now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 true so <clears throat> No, I knew I needed this master's if I mm. have to make progress within the academic in, yeah, field, 100%. which I had at this moment now I found myself in. Mm -hmm. So I went on, um, I finished my, my master's with uh, the, the, the feeling once I have my master's, then of course the opportunities those are going to open and I'm going to move to my next uh, opportunity. That wasn't the case. Gosh, it was finished. still not enough. Yeah, I finished <laughs> then um, started applying to, to higher learning institutions and they will tell you for you to apply, you need to send 10 copies uh, of application. So you could print, put in separate envelopes and mm. send to universities. I sent until uh, I realized that uh, this guy's no one oh, wants no. to get you. Oh, so no. uh, that went on up to around uh, 2018 when this now are... COVID was setting in. That was about five years. <coughs> Masters what? took about four years, uh, three years, then took one year to finish my thesis. So mm. I was finishing around uh, 2013, uh, around 2017. Mm. So 2017, 2018 was wow. like churning out now applications. Was it <coughs> frustrating for you? And how did you handle that if you were, like, you've done all this work throughout the years and you're still not getting the opportunities that you believe that you deserve? It was frustrating, but I still knew I'm, I'm still on time. I think I could look at what wow. I've achieved. Um, mm, Maybe the job opportunity is not there, but the profile I've built of myself was, was good enough and that was something, as opposed to if I would, could have just sat and said, if, even if I do, then nothing's going to come out of it, then personally, I will have not developed. Mm. So even though the opportunity was not there, thought of it like it's delayed. It's delayed, kind it's of an, thing. It delayed opportunity. Yes. You are a very solutions-oriented person, just from the story that you have mentioned to us because you you refuse completely to lie into the victimized mentality and just look for the next step and you are also very assertive with the decisions that you're going to make like even if it's going to be delayed gratification is still going to come which is again not something that people easily do so yeah you're a very solutions oriented person and I just want you to really acknowledge that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's good to learn something about myself. Yeah, it really that, is because that's, that's, that's every good. single challenge that you have mentioned, maybe you experienced, you've not once said, you've, you've said maybe, ah, it was challenging, but what could I have done? Like, this is what I needed to do. It was challenging, but this is what I needed to do. So that's, that's quite something. Yeah. And I think um, I've also learned a few things from... <coughs> My cousins who probably were in the same situation, mm. um, no mention of names, but there is a cousin who was almost in the same situation. Um, his father passed on, my mother passed on, uh, but he expected the family, the relatives kind of to take responsibility mm -hmm. of his life from there. Mm -hmm. And given that they failed to do so, so you blame them that they let you they let you on your own, and that's yeah. why things went wrong. Things went wrong, And I yes. think the moment you 
you start blaming someone for your, your own what demise. is happening. Whether it's their responsibility or not, blaming them doesn't really kind of help you in any way. So um, you have to, to take control of your own life journey or else. Or else I think the, the alternative which I've seen will happen and once it does, then you probably... You'll blame people, but they're living their lives. They're living their lives. Yeah, life yeah. goes on. And no one owes Generally, you anything. No one owes you anything. <laughs> like, it's your own life. You need to take control of the yeah, life. Yeah. Because if you don't, life will take control yeah, on yeah. your behalf. And things will happen and people will get past. People are, people are living their own lives. They also have their own things to take care of. Yes. So you can't add yourself to the list and expect life will happen. Life will happen for you. Wow. <clears throat> that's a source of inspiration right there <laughs> okay so now again, <clears throat> you finished your masters and you're waiting for that delayed opportunity so what was next after that so 2018 then, um, 2019 <laughs> funny thing then that. covid kind of uh, knocks on the door um covid came in around 2018 you finished my masters applied nothing 2019 um the covid kind of comes in around 2019 2020 yes right uh so 2018 nothing in 2019 i'm still applying got to attend some interviews um once was at um <coughs> this university along thicker road kca um not the other one uh usiu zetec oh ZTech. okay yes um, when they, um, the interview was great, I think the offer they gave wasn't so much from where I was. Mm -hmm. And so I decided it's better, than the devil you know, yeah, than um, <laughs> the angel that you don't. So <laughs> I went back to, to, to Oshol. Um, then around 2019, I kind of, uh, given that I'd sent out so many applications and nothing was coming through, I decided to kind of switch away from... The, the traditional doing of application printing and sending and set it online. So I was looking for opportunities uh, online, even beyond beyond uh, the country. Mm -hmm. And so at one point, I found a chance. Uh, I was just checking around, then I saw an uh, advertisement in African Leadership University. They were looking for lecturers, but the kind of one and traditional. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, lecturers. Um, in Kenya, by then, Matiang had just said, without a doctorate, uh, you yeah. probably will Won't. not get a chance. By then, I had just finished my master's, the journey to doctorate. Now they say, now you need <laughs> another thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I decided, let me try this. So applied, and I, then I was a little bit dis also dissatisfied with my current employer. I didn't like the way things were going. So in my application for this one was kind of a protest letter wow. to my current employer. They were asking, um, how do you expect the leadership to be? How, if you are a leader and you are making decisions, how will you expect them to be? And kind of, I was just kind of free. You wrote everything. I was just else. answering not with the thing in mind, I need to get this job, so let me frame my answers to kind of please whoever mm -hmm. be reading them. So I just uh, applied, it was around January 2019. Um, then COVID came, then that they went quiet, everything went quiet. Uh, Osho also went online. Um, then around September, Osho decided to cut it down because students were staying at home yeah. um unfortunately i made the list <laughs> oh my goodness i made the list of uh, people who should be redundant and that september is when now i received an offer letter from african, from african leadership, leadership university wow um offering a package that was basically five times what i was wow. getting at a at Oshol. And wow, and here's the delayed gratification <laughs> was finally. <laughs> yeah, like, like, um, and these guys, and 
So I write a resignation letter not knowing I was on the list to be laid off. Oh, you, oh. So I wrote a resignation letter and took it to the uh, principal's PA. And she's like, how did you know uh, you are <laughs> going to be laid off? <laughs> now she's already submitted it and like, what do you mean I was going to be laid off? I was what going you, to be laid you off. You guys were getting rid of me? <laughs> <laughs> she said, yeah. And I'm like, man, I could have known I could have stayed with the letter because you lay me off, you give me some send-off package. Yes. That would have been a good deal. <laughs> have given me a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> but I say, mm. no, um, what I've gotten is way better than that send-off package. Yes. So no regrets There's at all. There's two things I want to highlight from that story. The first one, I'm not sure if I remember the second one, but what I really wanted to highlight is that the authenticity in your application. And we're having a discussion on the table about interview process before we started uh, recording this and talking about the differences of when you go into an interview with that desperation to, pe to please the people who are interviewing you versus when you're just honest about your experience. I think that really saved you because it's like you are really just putting your heart in soul. And what's interesting, last just recently we interviewed someone who is part of the ALE, ALU, the African leadership ecosystem. Yes. And one thing that stands out about how African leadership does their processes is they, it's not traditional, as you mentioned. They want to know your leadership style, what your authenticity is. They don't look for the answers that you ex you are expected to give, but something that is very personalized to you. And so I really just want to highlight that, you know, when you go into an interview or when you're doing such like things, like being you and just saying, maybe this is my downfall or this is why I'm bitter about this or that, can take you further than giving the responses that you think people expect from you. So I'm really happy that you finally got your delayed gratification coming in. And so, yes, how was the <coughs> African, now you're going to Kigali, was it? <laughs> it was an exciting uh, uh, moment. It was, given the yes. circumstances that it was happening when COVID is um, ravaging its mm. havoc everywhere and where you're just coming from, things were actually not going to not work really out. out. I was just visualizing how it could have played out. And then I get uh, this offer, um, the African Leadership University says, we're going to facilitate you to move to Kigali. If you choose to come with your family, wow. we shall still take care of that. Wow. Um, one month paid uh, accommodation wow. as you set up your staff to know where you're going to live. And <clears throat> I joined a computer science department. The, the, there was a, this gentleman, he was called Dr. Don. He was a, Ran, a Rwandan. Donat Ngarambe, uh, mm -hmm. in full, we call him Dr. Don. He was such a wonderful man. Um, so he's part of the team that interviewed me, and you go to the department, and these guys operate on a level that there is, there is this community that is focused on achieving this objective, and of course the objective is uh, uh, making sure that we are training the students the right way, implementing the university's recommendations, on the training, making sure that the students um, are doing the best they can, especially on their projects as opposed to what I had experienced back uh, in the country in my first early um, training where you could actually train and everyone is focused on passing the exam. Yes, of so course. So these guys were looking at it differently. Mm -hmm. And basically they're investing in talent. They, they kind of have set aside this requirement, you must have a doctorate for you to be in this position. Yes. They're saying we are looking for a master's, but yes. then it's, it's not the academic qualification, what you're bringing along with yes. you. The practical skills, your um, <clears throat> outlook, on quite a number of uh, uh, things um, around the education, around training. And of course, we went through a session, um, a, a training session before we began to train. Mm -hmm. And there was um, another wonderful lady, I think she was American. Um, we all loved her and she, she, she left the university. But she also took us through the process of training, understanding 
uh, the student psychology, understanding what the student wants to achieve, uh, getting into their shoes and helping them accomplish their goals as opposed to you going there with what you think uh, is good for them and mm. now kind of telling them this is what is and you don't know you nothing don't know anything. kind of no. thing. And I think that <coughs> is such a difference with, like you've me been mentioning, how teachers here or trainers here are, or lecturers are trained versus that it's not about your skills, it's about do you have a PhD yes. and then what you say is is it's gold like that is the law but with ala with the african leadership um ecosystem they are very keen on also the the, the it matters more about the skills and your leadership role and impact and i think what's even better is also the students go with that mentality that i'm going into an institution that is like set for me to be a leader and you know you can see it from the teachers i do have a couple of people that i know in the ecosystem you, you can see that these teachers are also passionate about what they're doing and they're also going through their own trainings so that they can really elevate you so it's almost like everybody's there for a common purpose and that's to elevate everybody who is trying to make an impact whether that's in tech as in this case or anything that you want to do in a leadership position so i really do appreciate that okay so now you're in ALU. Interestingly enough, I was in Kigali just the other day, I think in um. August, doing interviews of people in the tech industries and also, but the, my highlight actually for this entire season, I'm not sure if this episode will be in season two or three, but in season two, the, the theme has been building the next generation of tech leaders across the continent. And that was really inspired by Carnegie Mellon University, which is oh, yeah. just, just next to ALU. To ALU yes. And I did that like about four or five interviews there and so it's just interesting to see Kigali is actually a really good place to be <laughs> uh, I 100% advocate for it but yes okay so tell us about your experience and then how that moved forward to you getting into Powerland project and so um of course we got in um and then uh the um the academic director now that wasn't the title but he was called Dr. Gaidi um Gaidi. Uh, yes okay uh dr Gaidi, he's uh from uh, i can't remember his country yeah. uh, so he's um he's the leader uh, like the leader of rwanda campus african mm -hmm. leadership university and this gentleman you sit with him in a room uh you you kind of kind of inspired and from there you, you don't wait to be told why you have to do the work that you're supposed to do. Mm. You feel, I have a stake to build what we are building. And so he kind of um, inspired us to go along. And I got in September uh, when I was leaving Osho College. Um, so we taught September until December. Uh, we broke off. Then the next year we reported again January February, COVID became a little bit intense. too intense, and we had now to suspend studies and mm -hmm. move online. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I actually moved back to Kenya because there mm -hmm. was, if we're doing online, the reason for staying in Kigali, there wasn't much there reason wasn't why much. I had to stay in Kigali. So I moved back to Nairobi at uh, that time. So we continued teaching online all the way to around September, um, going to November, around September there, um, a colleague of mine from JQUAT mm -hmm. uh, is called Edwin Mugendi. He knew of this uh, plan to start this Poland project mm -hmm. as a training. So he kind of gave me as a reference mm -hmm. uh, to the person who was concerned with hiring and told him, I have a colleague of mine from back in the day in campus. I know he's doing uh, good things in Kigali. He's in training, he's in tech. Uh, he could be the guy to actually help you start what you're trying to, uh, to start. So <clears throat> I get a call and I'm um, invited for, for a session for an interview. So I turn up. It was just starting. There were three directors at that point, John Kamara, um, uh, Irene Kiwia and Bendon Murgor. So on the day of the interview, the two are not available, John and Kiwia, so I meet Bendon. So 
after the session, actually, it wasn't more of a formal interview. Mm -hmm. It was just like discussing ways in which we can pull this one off. Mm -hmm. And through that, an evaluation of how my thinking process was and whether we could mm -hmm. actually help them, I could help them uh, get it started. So at the end of the session, I think he wrote a recommendation and gave a go ahead mm -hmm. that I joined the team. Mm -hmm. But I think the other members uh, thought that was too quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Let's it a little bit, we, we meet who this uh, guy is. So we had another virtual call. Uh, we now the three uh, of them. We, we discussed quite a number of things the approach to training, um, the aspects we're looking to accomplish, the goal PLP is trying to uh, to accomplish. And at the end of the call, they were very glad and I joined the team. So as I said on the first day, um, I was told now you're reporting to Mumbi. So I asked uh, where, where do I find her? So I was directed to uh, Pavilion uh, Westlands. So on the first day, as I was telling you earlier, I met Mumbi and we are supposed to create, to start the training, but then we don't have much on our plate. So, and I've been hired as the knowledge manager. So mm -hmm. I have to figure have out, to figure, it out. <laughs> to figure out uh, how uh, to get started. So <clears throat> before you continue, did you quit your job at ALA at this time? I mean, ALU or did uh, you? For the time we were remote, I, I went on with it for about okay. two, three months. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they, 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 um, they reopened fiscal sessions. Mm. And at that point, I couldn't be in two places at the same time. Mm, so you had to so I had to settle on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, this one had, was kind of exciting. I was in charge of creating something. Mm. And I really did look forward to create, uh, to help uh, create something uh, good. So. We came in, uh, as I said, when we were joining, I think the first people within um, um, Powerland Project was myself and Mumbi. Mumbi got there, I think, earlier. Uh, then I joined her. And we had to figure out now, how do we get started? How do you make an impact in people's lives? Yes, so there was the goal. We need to train one million people across the continent. Uh, training resources. We will have trainers, but uh, of course, one million, if you scale one million with the number of trainers, then you basically can't, can't afford the training mm -hmm. resources to do that. Uh, so how do we go about it? We could just have it be online, like create content and people can get in and learn. Sorry, maybe you can give my, our audience a bit more context about who Powerland Project is and what you're building and what you mean by one million. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, Palan okay. Project is basically an impact-oriented uh, organization. Um, our goal is to train one million software developers across the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we this goal actually was arrived at. Um, there is uh, many investors who came uh, within uh, Kenya and the continent trying to get uh, talented people. Uh, to help them with startups, and there are quite many. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had um, one who came in and couldn't find talent, mm -hmm. and is part of the team that helped uh, create the, the, the goal and the vision for uh, for Poland Project. And, and there are people graduating uh, computer science mm -hmm. and IT and all that, thousands each year from our universities. But the challenge was uh, these people who are coming out still with these companies coming in, none of them were offering the required skills uh, that these companies were looking after. And I think if I think back to myself, could have been one of those who could have yes. not really uh, given much to these companies that really wanted uh, people who are ready uh, to join in. So the question was, how do we then bridge that gap? Or if we have people who are graduates in tech uh, but then the skills that are required by tech companies, they don't kind of have them. How do we come in between and solve uh, that problem? Mm -hmm. So our goal was to design a program that is aimed at first imparting skills to millions, yes, mm -hmm. but 
making sure that the people who are getting these skills um, can actually put them to work. Yes. You, you're just not learning to, to get a certificate. Yes. yes. You're learning to get the right skills for you to put them uh, to work. Mm -hmm. So now the challenge was how do you achieve that you achieve within that? a very short period of time and a very huge number of trainees that you are looking to impact. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of informed the design of our curriculum. So I was, I was saying we could have chosen to have as many trainers as possible, of course, taking care of that in terms of uh, paying them uh, could have spiraled out of control. The other one is just create a course, an autonomous one online and have people sign up like the, the likes of Coursera. Yeah. The challenge to that is the dropout rate in such uh, courses. Statistically, yeah. just about 16%, 12 to 16% people finish mm -hmm. online courses. Mm -hmm. So we all join in enthusiastically, but no one no actually one gets finishes. to the end. Yeah. So we kind of came up with a hybrid between both of that. Mm -hmm. So we have a team of trainers, but not a very huge team uh, to overwhelm us in terms of uh, taking care of them and also not a completely autonomous program where people feel unsupported and at the smallest inconvenience someone drops off uh, the course. So we call it a hybrid. We have a 16-week software development program. Um, you are coming in even though you don't have background in computing, but if you do, then the better. Um, so we are taking you through these 16 weeks of intensive uh, programming um, uh, classes. Mm -hmm. So the approach, which largely uh, was inspired from what I experienced at the African Leadership University is, let the students center their learning around a project. Oh, that's so, good, <coughs> yeah. So it's not that um, we go to class and define things and you write notes and the next day, what did we learn yesterday? We remember what we learned and we continue. No, mm -hmm. start something. I know you don't yeah. know anything. But you have yes, to do a project. I think but that's the best way to go about it. Yes, let's start from ground zero. I need you to create a website right now, mm. but you don't know where to start from. So let's do this. Today we are going to learn how to create a page and a small sentence that says "Hello World," and we are going to put that one up. So we create that one page of our website with one line on it and leave it at that. Tomorrow in the next class, we build on it. Build so on it. every single aspect you are learning, it goes into the building of what you have. Mm -hmm. So there is the problem that the dropout rates is usually motivation. Mm -hmm. Students not motivated, but how do you motivate someone to learn? Universities, we are motivated through two models. First is, if you don't come to class, you get discon discontinued. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of you committing. Yeah. Uh, the other one is uh, the better performers, you'll be awarded this and that, mm -hmm. and you'll get opportunities here mm -hmm. and there. So there is negative and positive kind of uh, motivation. But here we're looking at what we call intrinsic motivation. How do you get a student to motivate themselves without the external motivations? So the fact that you're creating something and you're seeing it grow every single day, you kind of feel invested and excited to see it grow. So in that way, you get someone who doesn't know much about computing or uh, software development, but the moment, the first day they have whatever that basic thing they have created and they keep working on it, by <clears throat> let's say two months into it, three months into it, they have something tangible mm -hmm. that they can showcase. Mm -hmm. And four months, something has taken shape. The fifth month, you are now taking time to refine what you've been working on. And that not only kind of motivates the students to keep working, but it also opens a door for them to look into this tech world where the word tech itself is kind of scary. You step back when you hear tech. But then this guy has created this thing. So it has demystified this tech story. Mm -hmm. And you have literally empowered this that? student. Sorry. Demystified this tech story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. You have basically empowered this student to continue on this journey. 
Yes. So where you got this student as PLP <coughs> could be at a very junior level yes. of a software developer. But then you have opened this journey for them, for them to work on. Those. And if there was never a PLP, I saw a Powerland project class for them to join, they will never have ventured into tech. They will never have discovered they are also good in tech. They will never have progressed on the journey of tech. Mm -hmm. Just looking back, I think in the first um, 1,000 guys that uh, graduated in Kenya, at the point of graduation, they had kind of limited software development skills. Right now, most of them have actually gone ahead to launch startups. Wow. Um, yesterday, by the way, we had our second graduation. And okay. I did meet some of them. And one actually got a very lucrative job, and uh, they have their startup called a paid, probably is also supposed to appear um, on this uh, podcast, probably at some point. Um, <coughs> <laughs> when he came in, he was kind of like starting off. Now he got the knowledge. The most important thing is that he got a team to bounce ideas, ideas with, think about it as a team. And they created this thing. Wow. And we, we encourage them, keep working at it. No matter how useless at that point it sounds, the skill that you're working on, every day you're working on, more ideas come in. And you can't actually improve that that you're working on. You put it before an audience, they will critique it, which is good, which is, which good. is basically telling you this way it will not work, but if you try it this way, you have a chance of it working. So yeah. you might have your idea getting funding and you moving forward, but in the process of getting your idea to get funded, you're actually gaining very essential skills. Yes, no, <laughs> starting something and then just getting to where you maybe envision it and learning yes. through the mistakes or problems that you, you you solve every day, even if, like you said, today it's saying hello world, one page tomorrow, something else. The next day you have a website and now you're a web developer. Yeah, and now you can say I created something. And you created As something. As opposed to I can define what HTML is. You can define yeah. well, but the employer is not looking the, for definitions. Yeah, definitions. They want to give you something to work Sorry, on. Yeah. Uh, I just also wanted to ask you, how does it feel as when you see some of your students having success stories, what's that feeling as someone who's made an impact, an, a seeable impact in someone's life? It, it does feel good because kind of it connects with myself when I was starting out. Um, at that point in time, I didn't know exactly which way to go. Uh, someone could have started me along that journey, I could have benefited as much. So seeing someone um, probably avoiding that long road and getting this chance to develop their skills. So, so the, just as I said, intrinsic motivation to the student. I also do get motivated when I see mm. these guys now doing awesome. Yes. That's like when you're training thousands, uh, trust me, they're going to tell you, I show you my WhatsApp. They're texting you, sir, my project, sir, my project, my project, and you're doing thousands. Sometimes you got overwhelmed. Uh, you ask for assistance, but in most cases you try and answer not that it's a requirement by your job description or anything, but you just don't feel like you're going to let the student hanging when they are looking for your help to, 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 to achieve what they're trying to achieve. Because mm -hmm. they're going to go, uh, the fact that they have succeeded, that is, that's just good enough. Yeah. That's just, whether you ever meet or you don't meet, you just know that they got something good out of this. I feel like maybe you're healing a part of you that you never got to experience <laughs> the same kind of pathway. And that's a really good thing. And honestly, <coughs> teachers, trainers deserve all the love they can get just because a lot of us would not, be where we are if we didn't have the education that we have at one point or ex your entire life really so teachers do really have an impact in people's lives and i'm just so happy that you get to you know live that experience and actually people actually benefit from the the impact that you 
you want to have in their lives. And I think from just looking back at your story and also just where you began, wanting to create something for yourself, I think this is you now living into that want that you had even while you were younger. So yes, I'm really enjoying that conversation. Maybe you yeah. can also just highlight to us, we should, we should start wrapping up this episode, but maybe you <laughs> could just highlight for us um, one, when, how you get people, you know, how students can apply for this program, when they, they apply for your cohorts, and any other information they need to know if someone is listening and are looking to improve their skills, maybe this should be the avenue they should look into. Yes, definitely. Uh, if you'll allow me just before I get to that, yes, of course. I could also just like to point out the team at PLP. I think uh, when I joined, Mumbi kind of had this, uh, this trust, this, this, this confidence, and that space uh, to create, to operate, has allowed me to, to kind of really, really uh, see this through, uh, keep iterating and improving. In different situations, you're kind of limited to how much space you have to create yes. within. Yes. So I think that's one thing that has also helped us succeed. Um, but I think the most uh, guys I don't want to leave out is my team, oh, the yes. training team. The training team. <laughs> you see that the guys who kind of have daily sessions with the students. Yes who kind of guide them on a daily basis, um, support them through their projects. And they have sessions beyond what we have probably said, you will have sessions on this day and these days. Mm -hmm. And I think their commitment uh, goes a long way to, to ensuring that we have the success uh, that we have. So <laughs> there are great guys, you, yeah. there, there are awesome the people. Team. Yes. Yeah. Actually, how I learned about Parlan Project <coughs> was I met Mumbe while I was in Kigali doing my interviews. Oh. And she just told me about Parlan Project. And I think we also, I work for Honey Coin, as I mentioned, and I think on social media, they had had interactions with my boss, David Nandwa. And so I think I got really intrigued, even just knowing about what you're doing. And I immediately told her the day that I met her, it was her birthday, I remember. I immediately told her, I want to have a feature of you guys. So I'm very happy that you also honored my invite and you were able to come and share about the good things that you're building at Powerland Project. Okay. So maybe, yeah, I think you can now get into the program as well. Yes, uh, so um, basically our goal, as we said, is to train one million across the continent. Uh, we just got started. Mm -hmm. um, we just did a graduation yesterday of about 5,000. Um, These 5,000 were from Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Tanzania, and Zambia. Uh, so we have a new cohort slated uh, for around February. Mm -hmm. And so applications are ongoing. Applications. Uh, so if you want to be part of the cohort, um, you can visit our website, powerlandproject.org. Um, just Powerland Project. Uh, you can Google it, uh, it will turn up on Google. Once you go to the website, you'll see the application link. So what we are looking for, or what we encourage our learners to have is at least access to a computer and also access to an internet uh, connection. Yeah. Because being a virtual program, it will be very difficult for you to go through uh, with those, without those uh, essential uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Get in, uh, we shall have our own evaluation of seeing your sweet ability, uh, basically through a test. And also, we also look at your resilience. You could be good, uh, but then you don't want to sit around for the four months. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want, yeah, and dedicate your time. So we are looking at how resilient and how committed are you, you are to go through the program and of course, whether you have the foundational knowledge to also allow you to be successful. Um, we want you to, to get something. So if your foundational knowledge is, is a little bit not at par, then we will basically be wasting your time. So we also want to make sure you benefit and not just taking you through yeah. for the sake of taking you through. Which is absolutely fine and makes yeah. a lot of sense. So if you are interested in getting 
to refining your skills rather in software engineering and just have an opportunity to build something for yourself and make an impact. I think this is a lovely, pro a lovely program for you to enroll yourself in. And should you take this call, please make sure to tell them that you got the information from My Tech Story Africa so that uh, we can, they can also know the impact we are making here. And I am so grateful for you, you know, sharing your experience, your journey. I hope it's been good for you to reflect <laughs> how far you've come That's and been. also just talk more about Parland Project. Before I close off the episode, I do ask my guests four questions to close off. And the first one that I have for you is what's one word to describe the journey to get to where you are today and why? Um, one word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say incredible. Um, I think it's been incredible. It's been incredible. Um, from every turn, um, things have always taken the right turn. Uh, maybe with some pushing from myself, but <laughs> I've always <laughs> taken the right turn, and it's been incredible. I okay. think that will be that will what be I the word say. to go with. Uh, even okay. going forward, not just up to here. It's still incredible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, do you have any regrets or things that you wish you did any different? Mm, not really. Um, my outlook on life is usually um, what is done is done. Uh, looking back and wishing you could have done it differently just takes away the time we should be figuring out how to do something uh, uh, better as you move forward. So there are quite um, a number of things. Maybe if I look at the design of the program, I know had we done this, we could have done this. But now that I know that and I have the space to do it, simply doing, doing it, it as opposed to regretting I should not have done yeah. it that way. Exactly. Yes. OK. What advice would you have for someone who's looking to get to where you are today? <clears throat> My advice is um, right now is we are living in an informational uh, in an era of information. So uh, first, make your decisions based on um, the information around you, and always keep at it. Uh, there is always, if as I said earlier, if other people made it, so then you yeah. definitely. Uh, will also uh, do it. So it could seem tough, just know you'll do it. Just know you'll do put. it. Yeah. yeah. I think my last question is give us a powerful parting shot, but I think that do you have any other parting shot you would like to give our audience to close off the episode? No, I think um, <laughs> um, what I've always believed is that no one has monopoly over knowledge. Wow. So. Um, Always be ready to listen and learn. Uh, don't have the closed mind of I know it all and you or you or you can't tell me anything. Um, I love this, uh, there is a poem called uh, Desiderata. There is a line there that says, even them, the quiet and the dumb have a story uh, to tell. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter who, each person have their own story. So always be ready to learn. No one has monopoly over knowledge. Nobody has monopoly over knowledge and everybody has a story to share. The same principle that I carry along when I do my Tech Story Africa, because I do believe that everybody's story, everybody has something inspiring that they can share and their stories are always unique because nobody has had that ex similar exact experience as you have and even if they have the experiences even internally are different. So I do thank you for coming and gracing the podcast and sharing your story with others. And hopefully it inspires more, it inspires more people to do what they need to do and follow the path. If they want to pursue a career in software engineering, then Parlan Project is one of the best programs that you can get into. You have the guy who has built mm -hmm. such a lovely program and has a team of trainees that are absolutely phenomenal at what they do. So thank you so much for joining us, Robert, today. Thank you for having me, too. Yes. And 
If you've reached at the end of the episode, this is a call for you to subscribe from wherever you're listening from. Please join our community at mtsafrica.co and there you'll get the latest updates on what's happening in the tech industry, what's happening with My Tech Story Africa, and just keep up to date with everything and anything that should be relevant. That's what that is happening across the African continent. My name is Alice Kanjejo, your lovely host, and I shall see you in the next one. Thank you.